A CONTROVERSY OVER UNIONIZING IN CONNECTICUT IS MOVING FROM THE CAPITAL TO THE COURTS. WE WILL HAVE AN EXTENDED DISCUSSION ABOUT UNIONIZATION AFFECTING DAYCARE AND HOME CARE WORKERS. THEN A CONNECTICUT COMPANY IS BUYING AND REFURBISHING AFFORDABLE HOUSING AND GOING GREEN WHILE THEY DO IT. WE WILL TAKE A LOOK AT THE PUBLIC-PRIVATE PARTNERSHIP THAT SOME SAY IS CREATING AN ENVIRONMENTAL EVOLUTION IN THE STATE. You're watching The Real Story. I'm Lori Perez. We have been hearing a lot over the past year across the country about collective bargaining, the so-called assaults on it. To here in Connecticut, where the GOP says Governor Malloy is forcing personal care attendants and daycare workers to unionize. Connecticut's debate began, or heated up, I should say, with the executive orders that the governor issued in September, allowing both groups to form unions. Child care workers have already voted to unionize, and the ballots have been sent out to personal care attendants now. Here now to talk about what that all means is Representative Rob Sampson, Maureen Nelson of Connecticut Daycare Providers Association, and the Governor's Deputy Counsel, Chris Drake. Thanks all of you for being here. And, and let's you. let's start off with you know what it what you think it does mean. I mean, what does it mean to you, or what did you think, um, Chris, when the when the governor sent out those two executive orders, especially and some people have made the point that, you know, the Senate debated and decided against two bills last year that would have would have afforded these groups these rights and and um, why was it the right thing to do? So in your intro you mentioned the word unionization and I think it's important to make clear what the executive orders actually do. Um, the executive orders don't establish unionization. In fact, what they do is they allow family child care workers and personal care attendants, home care workers, to vote to establish a majority representative. And that majority representative would then enter into completely non-binding discussions with the Commissioner of Department of Social Services and Developmental Services. And so we think that is, that's completely different than unionization. I think most people sort of understand the concept of unionization which is a formal legal arrangement between an employer and an employee that results in a binding collective, bind, a collective bargaining agreement. And that's not what the governor set up here. But, but it was kind of a segue to unionization then, it, right? It's certainly an interim step to it, yes. Okay, and, and Representative Sampson, I mean, what's wrong with that? Well, uh, I would say first and foremost that uh, the executive orders are absolutely binding. They do set up the process for unionization, and as you stated from the outset, the daycare providers have already voted, and there is a union in place. Uh, the governor, essentially, in the executive orders, establishes the process by which that unionization will take place, including the uh, the rules for that election and so forth. And that's just one of the many things within the executive orders that I have a problem with, uh, because I don't believe the governor has the authority. Uh, that would be the authority of the legislature to set up the rules for which any group would uh, unionize. And in fact, I think that the uh, daycare providers and PCAs, had they wanted to do this on their own, which I would absolutely be behind them 100% and I wouldn't be here today, um, I think they've tried, if they tried to do it on their own, they wouldn't be able to because I think there are far too many labor laws that prohibit groups uh, such as uh, daycare providers and PCAs from unionizing because they are not, uh, they don't have a collective uh, uh, they're, they're not in the same group. You know, when you think of a union, it's typically people that all work for the same company or the same industry, and they have a common set of, uh, you know, things that they live under. Uh, these are individual small business people that are running their own individual businesses, and they happen to be on the final receiving end of a subsidy that is for someone else. Mm -hmm. The parents of kids that are in daycares, in the case of daycare providers, uh, and uh, ultimately the daycare provider gets a, uh, a check but ultimately that money's not for them. So the fact that that state money's attached to it is not a good enough reason for me to put them in a union. So let's just start off with, first of all, Chris, I mean, is that accurate that uh, had they tried to unionize without this, uh, without this uh, creating a majority representative that they would not have been able to, that they would have been unsuccessful? Yeah, so I want to make clear that I agree with Representative Sampson on the notion that without some legal form, there would not have been a mechanism through which the family child care workers or the personal care attendants could unionize. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably where the governor and Representative Sampson part ways. The governor feels strongly that there should be an opportunity for them to organize. And um, I think that that's important to, part, to point out because this issue has been framed such that uh, it's, been, it's been framed in, in the context of forced unionization. And, and that can't be further from the truth. The governor is for 
for choice. The governor is for allowing family child care workers and personal care attendants the choice to join a union. He's not for forcing anyone to join a union. And I just want to reiterate my first point is that the executive orders don't even go to unionization. They just simply set up a mechanism that allows family child care workers and home care workers to enter into talks with the state government. And so I guess, Marie, uh, if you could get involved, I mean, because Representative Sampson made the point that without this, um, likely would have failed. So what's wrong with, as Chris said, um, creating a mechanism for the opportunity? I had daycare providers asked for that opportunity. That would be different. But I was visited by the union. We were told what union. There, there, there wasn't a choice of choosing a particular union for us to choose or, or vote for. The voting process that was set up um, created a system that was extremely biased. They allowed them to use the Care for Kids list to vote for daycare providers to become unionized. If there's only 2,600 daycare providers that are licensed in the state of Connecticut, and not all of them are receiving the subsidy, and there were 4,000 ballots sent out, who did those ballots go to that got to choose whether I unionized or not? And if it was actually meant to be a choice, um, I'm a little confused as to why the state didn't send us any kind of documentation giving us and explaining the, the reasoning behind what he was trying to do. We've received nothing. Outside of a union representative knocking on our door, we've received nothing. No flyers, no any kind of paperwork telling us what people are deciding. So from my perspective, I was in my home doing my job watching the kids and I heard about a ballot going out and then as a person who should have received a ballot, I didn't. So should, I mean, I guess what would be your response to that? I mean, should... So the executive order sets out exactly why the governor thought this was important. He values the contribution that you make to the children that you serve. And that's why he thinks that's important to set up a mechanism to allow people to collectively bargain um, and hopefully rid the state of, of turnover in the industry, hopefully provide some sort of training to the family child care workers, and basically, in and, and, and the end game, hopefully uh, provide some semblance of uh, increased wages or perhaps uh, health benefits down the road. And he wants to give you the opportunity to collectively voice your concerns. And, and I guess I would say to you then, prior to issuing an executive order, why didn't he reach out to the daycare community to talk to us and see what direction we wanted to go in? if in fact that was the direction. You, you know, um, as far as unionization, I am not anti-union. I am, however, anti having my choice taken away. I am not for um, not having an open forum to discuss what they're trying to do to my business. I'm self-employed. I work for myself. There is no employer-employee triangle here for them to work for. You know, the things that the union has come out and said is the Care for Kids subsidy, which is for low-income families. We just received the check for them. As far as the education, there are so many programs throughout the state of Connecticut for child care providers and within my own community we fund and put up all kinds of workshops not just for providers but for parents as well uh, as far as it, health insurance there's many other ideas and and uh, available programs for people to utilize so to say that those things are you know health insurance and you know a 401k and all of those things I, I say to you then where's the money going to come from because you're going to take it from the the people that actually need it which is our children the, if money's being spent on um, royalties it's not going to who it was intended for and the children need it the parents need relief so there's no money our state is broke we all know that as taxpayers do you want to respond or, or I was just going to make a point. I mean, that being said, well, your, your group already has voted. Um, well, and not everyone in our group had that opportunity, which is something that we're quite upset about. There's 25 some odd people who voted whether we should unionize or not that aren't even licensed child care providers in our state. They're grandmas and grandpas. Why did they get to choose whether I'm unionized mm -hmm. or not? Unless the intention is to further down the line unionize them, which if you look at the very specific writing in the executive orders, they refer to regulations for child care providers that do reflect grandmas and grandpas, neighbors, daycare providers, and center-based daycares. 
So you don't you have a problem with the vote because I mean I've personally I've been involved in, in several union efforts and several companies mm -hmm. um, all of them failed mm -hmm. uh, because of the vote mm -hmm. but you have contentions with how the vote was yeah I don't think that the vote was the voting was conducted fairly I, you know the it shows when you talk to providers who didn't receive their ballots um, who didn't know what they were and were suggested to if they weren't sure what they wanted to do leave it to the people who were confident what they wanted to do well that's not sending in your ballot is like saying yes. Mm -hmm. So it's akin to a yes vote. So we didn't have a fair representation of people, whether they were interested or not. And I think that's where we're coming from. Well, I, there's a lot of things. There. <laughs> um, I think number one, uh, we should point out that the executive order set up a, a work group to, st to study the issue of formal collective bargaining, and I'm, I'm sure you were involved with the process. And that, and that group met, and it didn't involve anyone from our administration. It involved members from the executive branch, mm -hmm. but it did not involve anyone from the governor's office. It did not and, involve any home daycare providers either, and I did attend one of the meetings for that. And what I found to be um, very alarming was that the people that were not in a position to be recognized as um, political that sat on that committee were at the public, hear public hearing last week to vote on Bill uh, 352 wearing purple in support of the union. So I could go around the table with you one for one and tell you that that was not a group set up to decide whether we should collective bargain. It was actually a group set up to decide how we could legally collective bargain. Can I just jump in really quick? Sure. I'm going to give you a minute and then I'm going to give you ability to respond and then we got to wrap it up. Sure. Uh -huh. just very simply, this is an issue about freedom and that is where I part ways with the governor, period. Uh, he has taken it upon himself to put a, through a top down effort to put these folks into a union regardless of their own desire, period. And that's true for the daycare providers and the PCAs. It's a national movement. Yes, it's a national movement. It's going on in many, many states. No two daycare providers got together and said, gee, we need to do something about the uh, Care for Kids system and we must f form a union to make that happen. It didn't work out that way. What happened is the, gover the governor took it upon himself, despite three times now in the legislature, an effort to make that happen through the proper channels in the law. And, uh, and he did it himself. And and essentially has taken the rights away from individuals who do not want to be part of the union and not just individuals that work for some company or the state. These are small business owners, individual business owners. They don't have any obligation to the state in any way, shape or form. They should not be required to join a union uh, of other state employees. And Chris, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds to kind of wrap things up here. Sure. The, the governor did not take away anybody's rights through this executive order. In fact, he granted people rights. He gave people a collective voice where a collective voice did not occur before and and hopefully through that collective voice we we hope that they can achieve uh, real benefits to these programs because the governor feels strongly that these are important programs that provide important services to people and no money has come out of your paycheck or any other family child care's paycheck for union dues or anything of the such. Yeah. So there hasn't been any rights that have been trampled on, and if anything, uh, you've now been given a collective voice where you previously had none. But this, is the, this is the heart of the debate. This is why this debate continues, and Representative Sampson, this is why it continues now yes. in the courtroom. And Maria's voice was not heard. Right. She does not want to be in the union. She has no choice. She's already in the union. Okay. And I didn't get a ballot to vote. And, and had uh, the uh, Legislative Labor Committee uh, been successful, she'd be having dues taken out of the, uh, the funds that come to her. Absolutely, once that process well. started. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for all your uh, divergent opinions, obviously, and we appreciate it, and we'll keep following it. Thank you very much. Our next guest is uh, probably less controversial and uh, is the vice president of Vesta Corporation. It's a commercial property company that's buying and refurbishing public housing here in Connecticut and doing it while going green.